as you saw from the program, if you got the program um, that I detailed out for the day, they scheduled for the day, I was calling this you know, a question of ethics, which I sort of touched on earlier on. I could equally have called this a question of value, a question of meaning as well, because these are all implied in this notion of the question of ethics. Remember what I was saying, I'm trying to pull some of the strands together I've sort of thrown out during the day so far. Remember this morning I said to you that really <laughs> this approach within early Buddhism is, is is really asking us two questions. Um, and you've got these, you've had these questions throughout the day in different ways, you know, how do I live? What do I do? As long as you have, as long as you have the question, how do I live? You've got an ethical question. So it's nothing about the kind of lists of regulations and rules and kind of the rules that we normally associate with ethics. It's more of a question of how do we live in this world? And I think this two and a half thousand year old tradition has something to say about that. It gives us, if you like, the, the rules. It gives us the training rules. We've seen that. I went through those very briefly. It gives us lay precepts. You know, as, as people following this path of cultivation, it gives us precepts that we can live by. You know, taking non-harm, you know, not you know, basically taking that which is not offered, and not engaging in sexual and sensual misconduct. That's a very important one that's often missed out when um, I'm teaching retreats. I often emphasize when we're going through the precepts, this is one of the aspects that often gets dropped out. It becomes solely about sexuality and not about sensuality. As human beings, we're very, very sensual. Sexuality is just part of our sensuality. You know, so we can overindulge sensually. I mean, the contemporary world offers us so much we can engage in sense right? and in, sen in terms of sensuality. Then, of course, we have the precept of speech, which I've gone through a little bit with you, and just some questions, some basic questions around what really, and I think in contemporary terms, we translate this as you know, communication, not just as speech. Speech is now our form of using any form of language. One has to remember, of course, in the time of the Buddha, that you know, written language certainly wasn't a huge part. I mean, the first evidence of written language we have comes fairly soon after the Buddha's death. It was probably around, but nothing durable has survived. The only objects that survive with writing um, are the Ashokan pillars, and the Ashokan pillars, you know, approximately about a hundred years after the Buddha's death. So speech was the main thing, orality, um, we we're talking about an oral culture, was a huge part of what communication was. Writing was a very lesser part and actually was mistrusted for a long time, you know, approximately 400 years after the Buddha's death. And then finally, we have an injunction, lay injunction about, you know, basically looking at our intake of mind-altering substances, not because there's a prudishness to, to this, but because mind-altering substances are often pulling in the opposite direction to the clarity that we're seeking to attain through these contemplative practices. You know, if you're trying to have a mind which is less agitated, much more engaged with what's going on than, you know, drink, drugs, or any other mind-altering substances one, one might think of, are in a way pulling in the opposite direction. So that's the reason why, basically, there's a precept about that. These are the rules, if you like. Rules of training. Remember, I use that word sikapadam. You know, they're rules of training. Every one of them is prefixed by, I undertake a rule of training. As rules of training, they're not absolutes. Yeah. They're not absolutes. So we have to think very carefully. Um, the first one about harm, the ways that we do harm. You know, so it's not just about non-killing. We have to think about 
the ways that we appropriate things which are not offered. We have to think about our engagement with our own sens sensuality, obviously our communicative skills through language, either written, spoken, digital, however we care to look at it. And eventually, obviously, our intake of whatever we might consider to be mind-altering drugs, including probably caffeine, you know, if one is going coming down to it in the end. You know, so we've got a set of questions rather than a set of answers, you know. As the worst comes to the worst, we can use these as guidances, ways of training our minds. And that's how really why they're spoken of as being rules of training, ways that we train our mind, train the ways that we are in the world. But of course, they're not absolutes in the sense that they raise more issues than they really answer. You know, so some of the things I dealt with in relationship to speech, what counts contextually as good communication? You know, what's appropriate to the situation you might find yourself in, I don't know, in the next couple of hours after this retreat day is over? You know, how do you speak to your partner? You know, all of these things are questions um, that that we raise and they're ethical questions because they're about questions about the way I live with an other, you know, an other who is different from myself. Yeah. So as rules of training, they're useful. They're very, very useful. It's worth using them as guidances. Um, certainly for retreat situations, they are, if you like, the containers for the retreat and create an atmosphere of safety if people really utilize them and engage with them. But really, we should take them out into our lives as a set of questions. Yeah. A questions for ethical, moral engagement. We live, I think, in the contemporary world. And remember, I was saying this is Buddhist ethics for the contemporary world. Then we live in a world of ethical crisis on many, many fronts. Yeah, on many, many fronts, in the ways that people live, in the ways that our politics are conducted, in the ways that our social environment is organised, in the way that we deal with the environmental problems that we have. We have ethical issues on virtually every level. I think it always has been so. Interesting, you won't find anything about the environmental crisis in early Buddhist texts. It wasn't a problem in early Buddhist texts. The environment actually was quite a frightening place. He was really worried about what was out there that was going to eat you more than anything else. Yeah, so it's not the same kind of issue. So you won't find direct responses to that in ancient Buddhist texts. What you will find is an attitude. You know, that's what we're really looking for. What is the attitude that's coming out of those texts that help us to engage with life? As I said right at the beginning of this talk, that one of the things that we could say is when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about also about value and meaning in our lives. You know, what do we value might be another question for us. Yeah. Meaning in this particular tradition, I would argue, I'd take a lot longer to do this, but I would argue isn't simply out there. It's something that we're creating within our own lives. It's created out through our values and our ethics and our engagement with life in general. So we have to look at our values. What do we value? All of you will know, particularly if you've got a home practice that you engage in, that valuing one thing above another often means that you have to drop something in order to engage in something you value more. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. So if you engage in a daily practice, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it may be, and I'm talking about formal practice, I'm not talking about the informal practice of engaging these ideas in our ordinary lives. But if we engage in a formal practice, it generally means having to drop something to create time, particularly in busy lives, to drop something that I might value, but not quite as much as doing this practice. Yeah. And if you haven't got a daily practice, then 
you have to look at how much you value it. Yeah. And that's just one example, just from the sort of formal side of what we're engaged in. Yeah. As we all know from what I've been saying today, or hopefully from what I've been saying today, is that we engage in this practice wanting to increase our capacity to really engage with life, yeah? to pay attention, to actually to start to see things in experience in the ways that they actually unfold, not in the ways that we would like them to be. Yeah? I'm sure all of us have a desideratum that we would like life to be like. Yeah? Um, and that might be individual, but I would suspect that most of us wouldn't like to see the change happen so rapidly as we see it. Yet actually, one of the things that we learn to see actually in experience by engaging in this practice and learning to deal with it, to hold it in a different way is the change, which is us, as well as everything else. You know? It's not just the world that's changing, we also are changing too. You know? Often things do not stay constant in our lives, as we all know. You know? They don't, you know, there is no stability that we can ultimately hold on to. So it's a matter of beginning to see that, learning to pay attention. Seeing this as this practice as a way of starting to engage with life. To start to engage with life, and I was trying to sort of drop in some ideas in the last sit that we did, is to see the uniqueness of what we're experiencing. I don't know how much it strikes you. Again, I would want to engage you if I was with you face to face here. But I don't know if you see just how unique our actual experience is. Just something as simple as a breath, you know, is unique. It doesn't come back in exactly the same way again. You know, the long breath might, you know, the out breath might be longer than the in breath and the in breath might be shorter, so on and so forth. And it varies from each time and it's absolutely unique. It might be a, a breath of panic. It might be a breath of relaxation. It might be a breath that is mixed in some way of this. And each of that is unique. And okay, it's not a big deal. It's not, you know, kind of, it's not going to change the world. But in a way, I would argue it would it does slightly change the world because we start to pay attention to things in their absolute uniqueness. So when you begin to engage with life and i see the tree the animal the other human being you're engaging with unique life forms yeah with absolutely unique life forms when and again this is this is something that really struck me a number of years ago and it's always been there but it, i really sort of articulated for me when somebody dies or is killed you know but death occurs a whole world is lost yeah it might be a, not a world that you particularly wanted to yourself inhabit but a whole world is lost with that consciousness equally so with other life species as well when other life forms are lost whole worlds are lost in that movement when we lose parts of the environment you know with this devastation that's going on we lose aspects of our world, yeah. not just the individual world, but our collective world. Might be valued differently, might be held differently, but we're in the process of loss all the time. Now, loss is inevitable, yeah, but we don't want it necessarily to be fueled in the way through actually unethical behavior, yeah. which is often represented by. I don't know, collective miasma of greed that's often out there that wants more. Certainly, if our institutions and our corporations and I think a reflective individual life, we see that reflected in them. So greed gets made into corporate bodies, 
greed gets made into societal bodies in this way. So we're talking about in an ethical approach, a contemporary ethical approach, to looking at every dimension of the ways that we live. Really difficult. I mean, I, I, <laughs> as I say this, I appreciate the enormity of what I'm, in a way, of what I'm talking about and suggesting to you, that we're looking at looking at these huge, huge dimensions. But on the other hand, if we really start to tap into that uniqueness, that wonder of what is in Buddhist literature there's a word that's used which is um not spoken about very frequently but there's a word in pali called adbuta which actually means um a sense of wonder about things you know often at the end of discourses um what the buddha has given in the early texts you will find the monastics particularly but sometimes lay people as well monastics going adbuta adbuta wonderful wonderful what you've said but it's also used about the natural world that what we engage in question here how often you know when we i don't know see the familiar landscape when we see the familiar person you know um when we go to our place of employment or whatever how often do we sense any do we have any sense of wondrousness about it about that person that landscape that environment whatever it may be i think this is a fundamental aspect of the ethical approach that's being spoken about in these earlier texts that we start to get a sense of wonder back about our lives one of the great stultifiers of life one of the killers of life in a sense is that loss of wonder and being immersed in repetition being immersed in simply in seemingly meaningless repetition of things as all of you will know anybody who's done mindfulness uh, in any shape or form, but particularly in its secularized forms, know that mindfulness teachers go on endlessly about doing the washing up. <laughs> Usually taken as a, as a fairly routine task that most people try to get through as quickly as possible, or doing the cleaning or whatever it may be, but fairly mundane tasks in order to stay with it in a sense, I wouldn't, they don't ever use this word, but in a sense, see something different within it. So you take the familiar, defamiliarize it, de defamiliarize it with an attitudinal shift in the way that you hold it. Yeah. The question I would have in a big ethical sense is, OK, our rules of precepts, our rules of training are help us to ask questions and they help us to ask questions about basic ethical principles but they don't necessarily evoke that sense of wonder yeah one of the things i can say certainly about um european western culture but i think also most world culture in general is that we have tools for evoking that sense of wonder these are usually aesthetic tools the arts literature music things that actually bring us back to viewing phenomena in a different way yeah are getting us to approach them differently contemporary world maybe photography cinema you know you think about it i mean i don't want to kind of just give you lists here but think of the ways that somehow sometimes we can just be brought to a juncture where we see something differently yeah where we hold the familiar in an unfamiliar way. And when we begin to hold that familiar in an unfamiliar way, we begin to have an ethical response to it. If I really, really, yeah, and I'm you know, emphasizing the really here, if I really, really see the uniqueness of that particular tree or human being, how can I harm it? Yeah. That would be my question here. Yeah. And so if we, we talk about the rules of training, the rule of training, the first rule of training 
of course, as a lay precept, is to refrain from harm. That's at least a stepping back from the engagement in harming things and killing things. Yeah. The next step is in now valuing what I'm not harming. Yeah. So the first step is a good step, but it's a step of restraint. It's not a step of engagement. So it's like taking one step back to see clearly and then to re-engage with that new vision of what you know the thing is that I'm engaging with, the person, the object, the mountain, the tree, the animal, whatever it may be. Without that, I think that we're just consigned then to an ethics of lists. Yeah. And I think Buddhism, in its practices, and I can only give a very general sense of this in a day like today, Buddhism in its approach to ethics is getting us to re-engage in this subtle, sensitized way with the phenomena of our lives. Yeah. All too often, our anxieties, our problems, our difficulties, our relationships overwhelm us. Yeah. They, in a sense, block that engagement with the world. They turn us inwards. It's interesting that the word, you know, one sense of the word karuna, to have compassion for something in, in Pali and Sanskrit, actually has that sense of turning outwards. That is actually one of the meanings of it, to actually turn outwards. So I turn away from my own compulsions and turn outward to see a world, yeah. a world which I engage in. And to approach that world with a sense of harmlessness. If you like, the, the greatest virtue in, in Buddhist thought is actually one it borrows. It doesn't actually develop it you know, just for its, uh, out of its own thought patterns. It, it borrows it from Jainism or Jainism. And this is what is known as Ahimsa, in, um, again, in, in the early languages. And that sense of Ahimsa is that sense of harmlessness, of not harming things. Yeah. And that's the primary virtue um, that's spoken about. The others, in a way, are secondary, important, but secondary to that sense of moving through this world as harmlessly as we can. Yeah? Starting to value what we see, starting to value what we hear, what we engage in. How often... And again, this was a, is a question for everybody. How often do we really appreciate where we are, what we do, what we have? You know, even if it be very little, and I know there's so many people out here, even in developed countries, who have relatively little in comparison with those that have a lot. But, you know, thinking about ourselves, you know, with what we have, what we you know, have in our lives. How often do we really hold that in a deep sense of appreciation? Mm -hmm. I, when I was teaching Buddhist studies at um, Bristol University, um, we had a visiting professor who came from Tokyo. And he was a Shin Buddhist, if you know what one of those is. It's a particular form of East Asian Buddhism. And it's it, before he used to go into his department in the um, in the university in Tokyo. He used to go every morning to the temple, um, and he didn't do rituals or anything. His main thing was to clean the whole temple. He used to sweep it up and clean it and do everything that was needed to be done, and then he said he would sit down and just simply appreciate what he had in his life, what was good in his life. Yeah. So it was that deep sense of appreciation. I think it's a question for all of us, how much of us, how many of us do that? You know, how much of that sense of appreciative joy is in your life? You know, 
not just for the things that you have, but for the things that you are given. Yeah, I think that's a slightly different approach, but, you know, we have many things, you know, we have possessions, we have things perhaps we value for, you know, sentimental reasons and other reasons beside. But how often do we value the things that are simply coming through our senses? Yeah, simply coming through our senses, the, you know, if we if we have all of our sensory experience and we're not you know, having problems with our eyesight or hearing and things like that, how often do we value deeply that which is coming? What is given to us in our experience? You know, I look out the window at this moment when I turn away from the screen and I see trees. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to be able to see trees. And how much do I appreciate them, despite the fact they're there every day? I see them every day. And so it takes a real turning, what I call an ethical turning towards those things, to really hold them in my vision, to see them in a different way, to hear in a different way. Yeah. So this is a real task. It, ethics is not given to us on a plate. Our ethical engagement, our engagement with meaning and value are not given to us. There's something that we're creating in our experience by the valuing of our experience. And when I begin to value in these ways, it's a suggestion. Perhaps it becomes far more difficult to engage in a life of harm or at least to mitigate the harm that we inevitably do as we move through life. All of us, none of us can move through life completely harmless, but we, in some sense, start to damp down the harm that we do with awareness. Yeah? Hence the reason why it's so important for us to develop a sustained awareness of, you know, for example, our sensory appreciation, yeah? of moving into an engagement with others. So harmlessness is, the, is the, the primary ethical value that's held within, you know, within early Buddhism particularly. It's there throughout Buddhism, but stressed very much in early Buddhism. There's a, there's a well, he lived in France for a long time. He wasn't French, but he lived in France for most of his life. There's a philosopher, a philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. Um, but talked very much about ethical relationships. Um, and I think has a lot of resonances sometimes with Buddhism. He says, you know, ethics occurs for him in what is called the face-to-face -face relationship. You know, this, he's talking very much about ethics in a human sense, you know, between human beings. It occurs in the face-to-face -face relationship. He says, when you look at the face of another, you're confronted by an infinity. Yeah. The other is always non-capturable. You cannot capture them. But he said there's one thing that the face says, and this is the resonance with Buddhism. The face, when you look really into the face of another, it says, don't hurt me. That's what the face says. Yeah. Every face, every human being's face is somehow reflective of that don't hurt me. Yeah? And that becomes the basis for ethics, that sense of non-harm. So we see this being echoed, this idea of non-harm within other traditions, not just within the Buddhist tradition. And I think it should make us really reflect on the ways that sometimes unintentionally we move through the world engaging in harm yeah i don't need to go into it it's, it's so much part of the news these days that you know that the environmental crisis is such that we're losing the uniqueness of species on an hourly basis not even on a daily monthly basis but almost on an hourly basis you know even some of those you know small insects that disappear and you've never seen them ever you know, they've disappeared and it's again a whole world has gone that sustains the world that we live in 
Um, and I think we should just become aware of that because often that a lot of that is created by the ways that we live, the actions that we engage in, what, what basically we do. I just wanted to read you a poem actually right here, which was surprisingly enough, if I can get it up, written in 1960. And this is by a German poet. And it's called Das Ende der Augen. Eulen, sorry, der Eulen. The End of the Owls. And it's by a poet called Hans Magnus Enzenberger. And I think it personally, I think find it very moving. But he says, I do not speak of what's yours. I speak of the end of the owls. I speak of turbot and whale in their glimmering house in the sevenfold sea, of the glaciers. Too soon they will carve, raven and dove, the feathered witnesses of all that lives in the winds and woods and the lichen on the rock, of impassable tracks and grey moors in the empty mountain ranges, shining on radar screens for the last time, recorded, checked out on consoles, fingered by aerials fatally Florida's marshes and the Siberian ice, animal, reed and slate, all strangled by interlinked warnings, encircled by the last manoeuvres, guileless under hovering cones of fire while the time fuses tick. As for us, we're forgotten. Don't give a thought to the orphans, expunge from your minds your guilt-edged security feelings and fame and the stainless psalms. I don't speak of you anymore. I don't speak of the planners of vanishing actions, nor of me, nor of anyone. I speak of that without speech, of the unspeaking witnesses of otters, seals, and the ancient owls of the earth. Yeah. I think it's a very powerful poem because it really casts into mind that we're part of a whole network. And one of the things, of course, again, I haven't got time to go into uh, you know, in such a short day, is, of course, that one of the primary things that Buddhism has always spoken about, spoken about in psychological ways, but also in physical ways, is the sense of interdependence, yeah, of all things arise dependent on other phenomena. Yeah. We can't cast this simply in a causal network, but in a, in a chain of dependencies, of interlinkings. Um, we're all enmeshed in a world, you know, in terms of our minds, our bodies, our senses, what we do, what we say, what we think, and how we go on on a day-to-day -day basis. That, importantly, that engagement with that enmeshment in this complex world that we live in, it's getting more and more complex, I feel, in some ways, is aided by the development of our awareness. Yeah, by our investigation into our own behaviours and simply by keep on asking ourselves the question of how do I want to live. I know one thing for myself, I knew from quite an early age that <laughs> when I exit this earth sooner or later, the one thing I didn't want to do was leave a wake of destruction behind me, either physically or emotionally. Yeah. If we know anything about the notion of karma, it's not about literal rebirth. It's about what goes on after your death. Yeah. On a very basic level, we know that, for example, our rubbish is going to go on. <laughs> and I could mean that in a metaphorical and literal sense. The things we've engaged in, those we've interacted with, and being influenced and sometimes very hurt by us, that will go on, that will be passed on. How we engage physically with the world, that will go on. As I say, now I'm slightly joking about it, but you know, our, our debris, 
from our lives continues. You know? It continues on in the things that are virtually indestructible, you know, the plastics of this world and things like that that we utilize and we can't help. There's no sort of that sense of trying to make us feel guilty about this, but just knowing that this is one of the inevitabilities. And the ethical question then becomes, how do we minimize this? How do we not leave a huge wake of devastation behind us when we exit this earth, when we too finally go? As we will. Yeah. Is there a possibility of living in ways now that actually create harmony? Possibilities of living more harmoniously without acrimony, without these sort of things that you know we see almost on a daily basis um, happening in the world. And I don't want to sound too cynical because there's so much goodness out there as well. Yeah. But we have to get clear about in our own lives through the development of this awareness. So it doesn't become a question of ethics being the goal of Buddhism or meditation, but the two as a pair coming together to orient our lives as we go you know, and engage and we go through our lives. Yeah not harming, engaging in things perhaps in a way that is far less destructive. So we're looking at ways of minimizing the destructive patterns that we engage in. Now, of course, all of us habitual, all of us are a bit habitual in, in what we do. This is, you know, Early Buddhist thought highlighted this very simply. You know, we engage in repetitive patterns which are cyclical and they become sedimented in our mind bodies. Yeah. Some of those are cultural. Yeah. They come from your languages, your cultures. You know, we get in, you know, basically sedimentations from our upbringings, whatever that may be from our own personal histories, and they become habit patterns, which we continue to repeat. The question is to engage ethically with the world, we have to liberate ourselves from those destructive habit patterns. Not all of them are destructive. Let's, let's kind of put our hands on our hearts and say that. Not all of them are destructive, but an awful lot of them are. They're patterns that we have basically incorporated and i really mean that in the big sense of the word because incorporated means also made in a bodily sense it talks about how just you know it's also about our gestural response to living how do we live can we live in ways in which our body and our movement and our basic physical activities is reflective of an attitude that is quite quite different to the destructive patterns that we often embody in this world. There's, there was a text when I was very young that I read, um, which I'm not very fond of as a text. It's a great big baggy monster of a Mahayana Sutra um, called the Avatansaka Sutra. Um, it's a bit of a, it, it's a baggy monster in the sense that it doesn't have any coherence to it from my point of view. But one of the things that really struck me by in this was one only one phrase and it was a little phrase that said that the buddha walked through the world with bliss bestowing hands yeah okay it's a, it's a very kind of it's a religious image isn't it he walks through the world with bliss bestowing hands yeah yet if you think your way into that think your way into that metaphor walking through this world with bliss bestowing hands what would that mean for you yeah. It meant it would mean that the things you touched emotionally, physically, and that were somehow reconciled or healed in some way by your simple movement through this world in living as much as is possible. I don't want to overemphasize this and get romantic about it, but you know, as much as possible, how much could we harmonize and reconcile in ways in our own individual lives? you know, to walk through and that which we touch and those who we touch in our lives to be somehow 
the better for it, rather, you know, rather than the worse for that engagement. That is the ethical task. Yeah? That's the ethical task. How do we walk through this world in a way that heals rather than harms? Yeah. Okay, well, I think I've probably said what I want to say or have enough time to say. <laughs> in in this and again i want to just finish with a quotation it's not buddhist um it actually comes from a 20th century french thinker um most of you will know of course simon de beauvoir yeah, who was who wrote this in 1947 she says at every moment at every opportunity the truth comes to light the truth of our lives and death of my solitude and my bond with the world, of my freedom and my servitude, of the insignificance and the sovereign importance of each and every man. Here she means obviously men and women. There was Stalingrad and then there was Buchenwald and neither of the two wipes out the other. Since we do not succeed in fleeing it, let us therefore try to look the truth in the face. Let us try to assume our fundamental ambiguity. It is in the knowledge of the genuine conditions of our lives that we must draw our strength to live and our reason for acting. So really understanding the, you know, the wellsprings of our behavior, what governs our lives, actually helps us to act properly in this world and act ethically. <laughs>